Christmas is a time of giving. And I don't know how your mailbox is, but my gosh, every possible organization wants a little bit of our money. And so does the church. Hard to get out of here. You put your offering in, you walk out the door, and somebody's at that table, there's a crap show going on, and you go out to get home, and you go, boy, that was an expensive time. But you know, giving is really not about how much or how often. It's not about how much you make. It's not about how much you're worth. I came by the church last evening just to lock up and set the alarm, and the only light that was on was that little spotlight by the wooden nativity in the front lawn. And as I walked to the front door, I just looked at that little wooden nativity. It just has Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And I thought to myself, you know, that's it. That's what this season is all about. It's about a child. It's about a gift. It's about the humility of God's presence in our world. I mean, Jesus was born in a manger, born in a barn. The shepherds were the first ones to see him. These magi, wise men, came bearing gifts. Uh, all they did was kneel down and say thanks because they were captivated by Jesus' simplicity and humility and poverty. And this whole Christmas thing, it's really a way of life. It's about simplicity, humility, and goodness, and the power they can have in this world if we just give them a chance. It's about the power and the gentleness and the majesty of the collision of God's spirit and the human spirit. And Christmas is a universal story. It's ultimately, totally a Jewish story. It's about a Jewish kid who led a Jewish life and died a Jewish death. And then after he died, it got complicated because then we invented religion, which often gets in the way. And the message of Christmas does not speak to just Christians. I mean, it speaks to Lutherans and Catholics and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and even people that don't believe anything because it's ultimately a story about what's important in life and what's not. I mean, you, you don't have to hide Christmas trees in schools and public places. That's crazy. When you see a Christmas tree, you smile. Not because you're Lutheran or Catholic or Christian, you, you smile because it's a Christmas tree. And you don't have to go around saying, Happy Holiday, say Merry Christmas. Because it comes from the heart. It's a blessing from inside of us onto somebody else. Just, we need to step back and enjoy the magic and universality and the message of what Christmas means. And sometimes we kind of get away from that. Do you go to places, you know, see, like ministers, this is my church, but there are other places that kind of be my church too, where I walk in and I'm not a minister. For example, Nagel's Auto Service. I go in there twice a week, either to fix my car, or just to say hi. And I was in his waiting room, which is a service station waiting room, and I said, Dan, <laughs> in this very room, you know, I get good news and bad news. You know, sometimes you tell me it's not no big deal, Don, a small leak is 75 bucks. And then the other time he says, Dan, it's a transmission that's going to cost you $1,525. In this very room, Dan, I saw your dad grow old. I saw you take over. In this very room, Dan, this place with grease and oil and dust and all that kind of stuff, I see people from our church sitting there, some now who have died and gone before. In this very room, I see people with clunkers who can't afford to get their car fixed. In this very room, I've seen people hug their mechanic, which I do all the time. In this little room here, and it's not even a church. And then Danny says to me, Don, uh, I need to tell you something. Um, remember a year ago or so, we helped one of your parishioners get their car fixed? And I said, yeah. 
He said, well, she was in here today, and this is someone who comes here, but she does not ask for a thing. And she asked me how much it would cost to get her car fixed. She hasn't had heat in two years. And I told her, I said, I couldn't fix that car for what it's worth. I can't. I can't in good conscience fix it because it won't make it. And so he said, Don, there's a car here, the retired lady, she gave me the car and the title. She now lives in Florida. She just said, you keep the car, Dan. Can you sell it for 2,000 bucks? And when you do, let me know. So Dan said, uh, Don, here's the first 200. And I said, that means I'm in it for 1,800. <laughs> he said, yeah, I, Don, I know what your church is. Yeah, you, yeah you, I'll do two, you do 18. How does that sound? I said, That's, that sounds so Dan Nagelish, you know? And then I said, Dan, you're starting to sound more like an evangelist than a mechanic. And he says, well, Don, you've gotten to me over the years. I realize that this is more than a gas station. It's a place where people come for help. And I realize that giving, ultimately, is a way of living your life. It's taking what you do for a living. It's taking your little corner of the kingdom and using what you do, how you do, how you walk, how you live, to somehow make the world a better place without even thinking about it, just by doing what you do. It's about fixing cars and fixing hearts. It's about churches and temples and all kinds of places of worship coming together in the unity of the majestic human spirit that binds us together. It's about giving kindness and humility and generosity a chance to work in this world. And we don't need to be richer and stronger and right all the time. We just got to be who we are. Speaking of the word chance, um, and I know I mentioned this in my newsletter, but I only have one thought a week and I, I can't help it. But I mentioned, um, I came here in July of 1974 and they were there, over there. <laughs> and after my first week, they had a potluck. Back in the days of potlucks where the church would welcome me. And so we had a potluck dinner in what is now Charter Hall. And after the dinner, a lady comes up to me. And you could tell that she was like most people. She was a little frustrated because I was minister number six in the 12 years the church had existed. And she comes up to me, and her name is Mimi. And she looks at me, and she says, Pastor, please give us a chance. Please give us a chance. <laughs> and I looked at her, not knowing that 30 years later I'd be doing her funeral, not knowing that I would marry all three of her grandkids, not knowing that I would baptize all of her great-grandchildren. I said, you're talking about me giving you a chance. I said, no, no, no. You need to give me a chance. I mean, I just got out of school. I'm 25 years old. I know nothing about being a minister. I'm shaking in my boots. You need to give me a chance. I think of all the people over the years, and you can think of your journey too, all the people in your journey who have given you a chance. How many people have given you the chance once in a while to succeed? How many people over the years have given you a chance even to fail? How many people over the years have given you a chance to be yourself, to be true to yourself and try to find yourself in your niche in the world? And how many times have I been afraid to give other people the same chance I've been given because I get a little bit too selfish and wrapped up in myself. You see, Christmas is about God giving us a chance. It's about Jesus giving us a chance. And because giving somebody a chance is risky, it can hurt, it can make you sad. Every once in a while when things go right, it makes you sing a whole big alleluia. So in this very room, a lot of us have been given a chance. Nobody more than me, the chances you've given me over the years. And I will never, ever again take those chances for granted. And there's lots of people out there in the world, and maybe some of you in here, for whom life has not given you much of a chance. And I guess, ultimately, that's why we're here. Amen. If you're able to, please rise for the creed. It's on page 105.